Amen. So keep your place there in 1 Timothy. So we're starting our sermon series tonight, um, Science and the Bibles. We're going to look at um, science. We're going to look at the Bible and, and how those two things um, come together. We're going to look at science in the Bible um, coming up in these next uh, few weeks. Look down at 1 Timothy chapter 6. So Timothy, of course, is an upcoming uh, pastor that, that Paul is training. And Paul um, is warning Timothy about some of the things that he is going to um, come up against um, in Timothy here, and, and especially in verse number 20 and verse number 21. Um, the Bible reads, if you look down at your Bible at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 20, it says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. Of course, uh, profane and vain babblings, meaning babblings, meaning things people are saying just to glorify um, themselves, the Bible says, and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. So there is, uh, you know, we need to look at some definitions before, and that's going to be the purpose um, of the sermon this evening. We're going to look at some definitions of what um, science is what it isn't, um, what's taught today, and what's the difference between what's being taught today and, and the actual um, word or definition of science. And then we'll look at the Bible and science in weeks going forward. But look, there is science in the Bible. The Bible contains science, okay? And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next. And, and a better way of saying that is the Bible, you'll understand this uh, phrase a little bit better towards the end of the sermon, but the Bible contains scientific things is a better way of saying this. You know, we're going to look at the actual science of these things and where they are in the Bible um, next week and the weeks following. But the Bible here in Timothy is actually saying the word science is only in the Bible twice, I believe. And we're going to look at both of those here in a couple minutes. But one of them is right here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 20, where the Bible says that there's false science, that there's science out there that's falsely so-called. Now, you think about this. This was written in, I don't know, 50 or 60 A.D. Um, science is a thing, and he's saying there's going to be false science even back then. Just as it says in Ecclesiastes, there's no new thing under the sun, folks. Anything that we see today has happened in the past. But there is false science is what Paul is warning Timothy against. And look, notice the phrase that it's used in. It says, oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Meaning, this false science is going to be used to, what's he warning him against? He's warning him against false doctrine. He's warning him against people that are going to come in and say profane and vain babblings. They're going to come in and they're going to use these things to change your doctrine. They're going to use these things to attack the Word of God, is what he's saying. Oppositions. It's not just, oh, science, false science is going to be there, Timothy. He's saying this false science is going to be attacking the Word of God. It's exactly what we see today. And I'm going to show that to you this evening. He's saying this false science, this, this thing that people, and I'm going to show you what that thing is in just a couple minutes, this thing that people are calling science is going to be used to oppose the Bible. You say, well, what, what is this? What is this thing? If it's not science, what is it? Okay, I'm going to tell you what it is in just a couple minutes. But first of all, what is science? Okay, what is science? Because I don't think anybody knows this today. I don't think anybody knows what science is. Let me read you a dictionary definition of the word science. Okay, the, not, I always say the Bible. The dictionary says this. The systematic, and by the way, the dictionary is changing words, by the way. The, dic the dictionary is changing what words mean. That's why it's always, it's always good to have the Bible, you know, define the words in the Bible. Okay? Look at science um, from the dictionary. The systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation, experimentation, and the testing of theories against evidence obtained. Against the evidence obtained. That sounds pretty good. I mean, I would pretty much agree um, with that. But then there's, they always have the archaic definition. If you go to uh, modern dictionaries now, here's the archaic um, de definition of science. You turn to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to let the Bible define this word for us. All right, here's the archaic definition of science. Knowledge of any kind. <laughs> so it's basically taking a little shot at the dictionary. It's taking a little shot at the Bible here. It's saying, oh, when the Bible uses when the Bible uses, especially when it, the archaic word is, is kind of like, you know, the, what the King James uses, 
you know, that would be the archaic um, word. Um, many times would be that archaic definition. But the Bible does not define science as knowledge of any kind. All right? The, there's, the other time science is used in the Bible is in Daniel chapter 1, when it's actually describing Daniel and the, the young men that were brought over um, from um, into captivity um, in um, that first wave of Babylonian captivity. Look at Daniel chapter 1 and look at verse number 4. Look at Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 4. The Bible says this about Daniel and his friends. Okay, It says, children, I mean, these, these, these kids that were brought over were so wise, they were found to be so beyond anything else that the king of Babylon had um, in his palace that they were just super valuable. Even when the Persian Empire took over the Babylonian Empire, Daniel was still made second in command of the Persian Empire. That's how valuable his skill set was. Okay, And it's describing his skill set right here in verse number 4. It says, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored. And look at this. It says, and skillful in all wisdom. There's the first thing it says. And cunning in knowledge. And then look at the third one understanding science, and such as had an ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. So the Bible describes they had three skill sets here. The first one is skillful in all wisdom. The second one is cunning in knowledge, meaning cunning in knowledge means they know stuff. That's what that means. You know, and look, skillful in all wisdom is you say, what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Okay, I know some really, really smart people that know a lot of stuff, but they don't apply any of those things. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is applied knowledge. You can be the smartest guy in the world and know every answer to every trivia question and everything in the world, but you apply nothing, and it will do nothing for you. It's the same thing with the Bible. You sit here and just listen to the Bible and listen to the Bible. You could know, like, I can't tell you how many t times I've had people that apply none of the Bible tell me how many times they've read the Bible. I've read the Bible ten times, cover to cover, this and that and this and that, and they apply none of it. It's like, it's just a disaster. Because knowledge is one thing, wisdom is the application of that knowledge. So here the Bible is saying, it's saying some pretty powerful things about Daniel. It's saying he's cutting in knowledge, meaning he knows a lot of stuff. And he's also good at applying that stuff, is what it's saying. But then there's a third thing. Then there's a third thing here. So science can't mean just all knowledge, or the Bible is basically just repeating itself for no reason here. So it's saying, and on top of that, he understands science. All right, so look, science is the first definition of what I told you, that, you know, uh, from the dictionary. It's, it's basically ex observation, experiment. It's a method and testing of theories. It's basically observing something. I mean, if you remember this from, from high school, you know, some of you probably wasn't that long ago. You remember a hypothesis? I mean, there's a word that you'll never forget, right? You have a hypothesis, meaning you think something, you, it's, a, it's a conclusion that you think is going to happen. Like if I, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a conclusion that you're trying to prove, and then you use science to do an experiment to test your hypothesis. Or, you know, it's really a theory, is what it is. But science is the method, it's the process, it's the, it's the testing, it's the experimentation. In science, you're building things, you're building apparatuses and test, you know, cases and all this kind of stuff. I did this for years, um, studying things and looking for solutions um, in my job. We would just build all these crazy contraptions and we would just try stuff. Look, that's science. That's what it is. It's a tool of studying, observation, experimentation, basically of the natural world. It's a way of observing and testing the natural world. It is, that's science. All right? But the attack on the Bible today is saying that the Bible contains no science. Right? So what you're being told today is that you either believe science or you believe the Bible. But you can't believe both. You know, this is where all these... You know, these yard signs are like, trust the science, you know, or I believe in science and all this kind of stuff. But I want to prove to you tonight that modern science, or what they are talking about, is not science. Okay, the title of the sermon this evening is Scientism. Scientism. 
You say, what in the world is scientism? Pastor, are you making up words? I'm not making up words. Scientism is what is taught today. Scientism is what is taught in high schools today. Scientism is especially what is taught in universities today. And scientism is an actual word. It's not used very much. People don't know what it means, but what it is, is here's the actual definition, all right? And then I'll just kind of break it down for you. But it's the excessive belief in the power of scientific knowledge and techniques. Excessive belief. It's much like pluralism, you know, secularism, humanism, scientism. Scientism. Scientism is, a, in a nutshell, here's what scientism is. Scientism is the teaching that science can explain everything. That's what scientism is. And that is what is taught today. When you hear somebody say, oh no, I don't believe the Bible, I believe in science. They believe in, they have been taught that science is scientism. Or they've been taught that scientism, is, what they think is science, is really scientism. This belief that science can explain everything. And look, it's simply not true. And I'm going to show you that tonight. I'm going to show you that from the Bible tonight. It's not true that science can explain everything. Science meaning what? Experimentation, observation, experimentation, and the testing of a theory. Science just cannot explain everything, period. All right? Let me give you a couple examples. Human origins. People say that human origins, well, follow the science. Follow the science. So what is the science? The science of human origins that's pretty much just accepted today is the Big Bang Theory. Now, for those of you that went to high school in the last 10 or 15 years, when, I, when the Big Bang Theory was taught to me in school in the 80s, we thought it was a joke. Like, seriously, we made fun of it. I mean, even the teacher was, like, not really taking it that seriously. You say, you know, it came from the origins of it. It's not that old. The origins were from the 1930s or something. And guess who, guess who came up with it, by the way? It was a Catholic priest. Shocker. But the point is, the Big Bang Theory, no one has ever tried. I mean, it's the dumbest thing ever that, that you know, everything was this compressed singularity in this microscopic dot, every piece of mass in the universe. And then it, the Big Bang is it exploded. It exploded, and this is why we are here, basically, right? But look, let's talk about science now. No one has ever tried to recreate this. No one, no one has ever tried to produce order from an explosion, ever. Why don't we go and take someone's messy house, if we're going to just test this, we'll take a thousand messy homes and we'll blow them all up and see if they get better organized. You're laughing. Ha ha. Because it's dumb. We actually have done a lot of experimentation on explosions actually in the United States, but back in the 40s and 50s we were testing, you know, some of the biggest explosions that, that man could even create. You know, testing atomic bombs. You know what we did though? We built towns. We built mock towns to watch the destruction. Nobody, nobody was out there as part of the Manhattan Project trying to figure out if one of the explosions created, like, created a village or something, you know, or made a car or whatever. Because, I mean, just, it wasn't even a thought because it's, it's ridiculous to even think about that. It doesn't even make common sense, right? Look, as a matter of fact, you know, Nagasaki and, and, and Hiroshima, when we dropped the atomic bombs on actual cities, nothing was created. There's all this testing. Nothing was created. As a matter of fact, hundreds of thousands of lives were destroyed instead. The entire cities were destroyed. So look, it's not science is what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's not science. Nobody has even tried to, it, the theory itself, no one has even tried to use science to test it. It's so ridiculous. I mean, that doesn't even, you know, talking about the, the singularity, the singularity. You know, you think about, Every piece of, of mass in the universe compressed into a microscopic dot, or however big they say it is. That's not science. No one has ever tried to test that. No one could ever, because you know what you have to do? Again, what do you have to do with science? You have to make an apparatus. You have to make something to test it with. 
we go, we would test things on systems in the power plants and I had this team of guys that could build anything. Like I'm just like drawing stuff on the whiteboard and I'm like I need uh, a tilt switch that looks like this, I need some kind of vessel that can hold this kind of pressure and these guys just make anything out of metal, it was crazy. But some kind of apparatus that can compress the entire universe into a, 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 a tiny microscopic dot, no one would even think about that. It, it's ridiculous to even think about it. You're like just the, I mean modern hydraulic systems work on the principle that fluid water and especially oil is not compressible yet we're going to compress everything into a microscopic dot right well you know then then what they do is they use they use, use the same method to get people to buy this on every single one of these theories they use this sensationalism where they're like i mean think about the pressures that must be involved there think about you know that's why, look, if we could achieve pressures of, of this type, we would have machines that were super efficient today. You know, the reason that your car is not more efficient is because, you know, we can't raise the pressure high enough and we don't have materials that can contain that pressure. If you want to take a thermodynamic machine of any kind and increase the efficiency, you need to you know, raise the temperature and raise the pressure. That's how you do it. But we don't have materials that can contain it. That's why diesel, uh, diesel engines, are more efficient and put out more torque than gasoline engines because there's higher pressure there. There's higher pressure. But what the point I'm trying to get you, get you to understand is the pressure and, and so you're like, well, how could that be even possible? No one's built a machine that could even take this pulpit and compress it into a microscopic dot. You're talking about the entire universe? But here's what they say, oh, well, the pressure was infinity. <laughs> like, oh, I get it now. You see, they just throw out some some, no, that's not even a number. They throw out some idea that you can't even imagine, right? And then people just stop thinking and they're like, oh, but it was infinity. It was infinity. So look, this is not science is what I'm trying to get you to understand. These are theories. There can be no experiment that tests these things, all right? There can be no apparatus that's built to test you know, the Big Bang or this compressed singularity, you know, there has been no experiment, there has been no evidence, you know, I mean, just think of the universe, it exploded and all of a sudden we get these beautiful galaxies and these perfectly round planets with these beautiful rings around them and all this stuff, it's like no one has ever done anything, even through all the explosions that have happened ever, that has done anything that has created the slightest bit of order. As a matter of fact, entropy, as we talked about a couple years ago, is only increasing. Things are getting more and more disordered all the time. All right. So look, the point is, it's not, a, it's not science. It's a theory. These things are theories. And they are not provable through the tool of science. So not only are they theories, but you can't use science to prove them. So this idea of scientism that you can know everything and everything can be explained through science is false. Is what I'm trying. It's, it look, it's science, falsely so-called. All right. And they use this sensationalism to get people to just quit thinking. You think about the origin of species. It's the same thing. It's all the same thing. Once you recognize the pattern here, think about the origin of species that through this explosion, right? came, uh, you know, suddenly there was a, a bacteria and then a cell and then a, a, you know, germ or whatever and then pretty soon we had plants and bugs and then you. But no one has ever been able to experiment and show that. There's never been an experiment that shows that. They're like, oh, well, a, 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 a bird vertebrae looks like a lizard vertebrae. So there you go. So what do they do? You're like, well, I just don't see how species could move from species to species. There's never been an experiment. There's never been an example. There's no fossils, nothing. How could that be possible? They're like, well, it was billions of years. And you're like, oh, that explains it. It's the same thing as, what could, I mean, what? Well, infinity pressure. That's what kind of pressure? Infinity. 13 billion years. How are you, who are you to say what could happen in 13 billion years? And people are just like, whoa. It's like the national debt, right? <laughs> People are like, $31 trillion. If you stacked up those $100 bills, they'd go to, I don't know, past the sta space station, I think. 
But the point is people just, they can't even comprehend that kind of number, so they just shut off their brains and they quit thinking about it. All right? You just add billions of years, you add illustrations, you add some Hollywood in there, and all of a sudden you got the origin of species, right? But it's essentially the same method for, you know, all these other secular theories, all right? People shut off their brains, they agree. But again, it's not science. It is just a theory, and it is one, it's not provable by science, and it is one that requires literal blind faith. It requires blind faith to just believe, oh, billions of years, okay. Oh, infinity pressure. That's never been proven anywhere that that could even, be, that could even happen or anything could ever contain that, but <laughs> blind faith. That's what it is. That's all it is. You know, it's scientism, folks. It's scientism. This is what scientism is. This belief, this teaching that science can explain everything. It is clearly false. The, the global warming and the climate uh, sensationalism is, is, is more of the same. All right, it's more of the same. If you go back to, you go back to the first Earth Day in the 70s, I think it was, maybe it was 1970, the first Earth Day, and just go and you can come up with all the quotes of all the scientists of that day. Let me give you a few. There was a Harvard biologist, this is 1970, named George, George Wald, who said that the Earth was going to end in 15 to 30 years. Overpopulation, starvation, um, you know, we can't, you know, everyone's going to die. We're starving. Yeah, what happened? Well, we got technology. Technology increased, it changed, we can grow crops, all these types of things. Paul Ehrlich was a popular one back there in the 70s, like we're all gonna be walking around in gas masks in just a couple years, because the pollution is so bad, right? But what happened? Yeah, there was smog everywhere in cities, back in the 70s and the 80s and all that, but what did we do? Technology, you know what, you know what how those how catalytic converters and all these SCRs and all this ammonia injection, you know how that was created? Science, experimentation. People building things, trying things, testing things, learning things, and they solve these problems. Ken Walt, he was an ecologist back in the 70s, he said the earth is going to go dark and nothing will be able to grow. Because of all the pollution, the sun is going to be blotted out from the pollution and nothing will be able to grow. He's like, we're going to run out of oil. He had some quotes, he's like, you're going to pull up to a gas station and, and you're going to say, I need some gas, and they're going to say, sorry, the earth is out. Yeah, what happens? We don't find less oil, we find more oil. We just keep finding more and more, and we have better technology to get to different oil in different places that you never would have thought about um, getting before. He's like, we're gonna be in an ice age. The same guy said we're gonna be in an ice age in just a few years. So, you know, I mean, these are all theories, folks. This was the science of the 70s, but it's not science, it's scientism. It's scientism is what it is. It's just theories, and these theories, the global warming, all this type of stuff, it's just theories that can't be proved by science. It's, it's like a huge simulation, this universe, this earth especially that we're on, and they take one tiny little variable and say, well, there's the science. No, there's, there's no science there. That's just a theory that can't be proved by science. All right? So look, that's your university science right there. It's scientism. This idea that it's this, or science. That's why everyone's like, oh, the Bible? No, I believe in science. No, you believe in scientism, which is clearly false. I just explained it to you in, well, 15 minutes, that scientism is false. You say, but okay, what about the Bible? What about the Bible? Turn to Genesis chapter 1. You say, what about the Bible? What about the Bible account of creation? What about the Bible account of Man, where we came from, all these things. What about the Bible about, um, I'm really concerned about climate change. I can't sleep, or I, I, I can't even believe I say climate change now. Global warming, global cooling, they say climate change just in case they get it wrong, right? They learned from the 70s and the 80s. So if it cools down, they win. If it heats up, they win, all right? Look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. Well, the Bible explains everything. The Bible gives clear explanation of everything. Look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 4. So God created the heaven and the earth. If you continue reading Genesis chapter 1, you'll see this phrase in Genesis chapter 1 over and over again, and God said, and God said, and God said. So God created the universe by literally speaking it into existence. He spoke and it happened. You say, wow, how is that possible? Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4 
and look at verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 4, and look at verse number 12. And I understand that this isn't the main application of this verse, but it is a, it is a true def, uh, application. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, and look at verse no, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. The Bible says, for the word of God, the word of God, meaning what God speaks, all right? The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper. Quick and powerful. Quick meaning, it doesn't mean it's quick like it's fast. It means like it's quick meaning it's able to make alive. It's able to like make alive. Like we can't make one cell alive. We can't create with all the, the semiconductor technology. I worked in an industry, we could put 20 million transistors on a chip the size of a pencil eraser. 20 million. And to this day, when I was working in that industry and I designed those circuits, I was like, I was amazed that we could build what we designed. I was just amazed that we could fabricate that. I was like, so amazing. But you know what? We can't quicken anything. We can't quicken anything. We can't create life. We can't make a single cell alive. We can't make a fly. Oh, look at all the robots and the AI. Hey, build a fly. Build a beetle, please. Build a bug, somebody. We can never do it. It's the word of God that's quick, able to make alive. Right? And what? And powerful. You say, where did, where did all the stuff come from? Where did all this, you know, mass and where did all this energy come from? Well, God spoke it into existence. Because the word of God is quick and powerful. Look, my, my word is just some guy's word. The only reason that gives my preaching any power is because I'm reading God's words. Because I'm referencing God's words. I'm just a man. I'm just a man standing up here and just reading God's word, which is why the preaching is powerful, because it's God's word that has the power. But let's continue reading. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, meaning it will, it will hit your heart. And you'll see this if you're a soul winner. You'll go out there and you'll preach the gospel to somebody, and you will see it uh, affecting their spirit. You will see it as their eyes well up with tears. You will see it affecting their soul, and their spirit. You will witness that face to face. It's a, it's a, you will be able to physically see the power that the word of God has on, someone, on someone's spirit. Do you hear what I said? You'll be able to physically see the spiritual power of the word of God. That is a super cool thing, by the way. Because you're literally physically seeing spiritual power. And it's, it's really awesome. But why is it? Why don't we go out and preach the gospel and just explain Jesus to people in our own words? Why carry a Bible? We carry a Bible for two reasons, because I could memorize all the verses, right? We carry a Bible for two, two reasons. The first one is this. It's God's word that has power, not ours. The second one is, I want to be able to show people. I tell soul winners, you don't have to memorize the verses. It's good to memorize verses, but you don't have to. Why? Because you're reading them and showing them. Because, I'm sorry to break it to you, but like, you don't have any credibility to somebody you just met. You don't have any credibility. I don't, I don't have any credibility to somebody that I just met at the door. They don't know me. But you know what they do know? You know what most people, is, you know, most people in Fresno respect this. They respect the Bible. So you show them from the Bible, and they're like, oh, oh, that's the Bible. And then you explain what it means. And look, you can see it affect people. You're going to see it affect people spiritually, but you can see it physically. It's really cool. It's a really cool proof from the Bible. Let's keep reading. So it has spiritual effects on people, God's word. Okay, it's, it's able to make alive, it's powerful, and it spiritually affects people. But look at this, and the joints and the marrow. It physically affects people too. So God's word is able to make alive. That's how he spoke us into existence. It's able to make alive. It has power over people's spirits. And look, it has power over this physical world, folks. Jesus, the Word of God, is defined in the Bible as the Creator. That's how He could create the world, because the Word of God, Jesus, as it became flesh, has actual physical power over the universe. So the Bible explains everything. The Bible explains everything. Global climate. The Bible explains that too. Turn to Genesis chapter 8. You're like, I'm really worried. I'm really worried that uh, my SUV is going to destroy the earth. 
Look at uh, Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 22. Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 22. So God's word has actual power. This is how it happened. Look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 22. God says this after he literally flooded the whole earth, and he didn't destroy the earth. He destroyed man on the earth. All right? Look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 22. God makes a promise, and he says, While the earth remaineth, he says, Seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Maybe that guy from the 70s should have read that. He's saying, you know what he's saying? He's like, you know what? This is a promise. You know what he's basically saying from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 8? He's saying, I started it. I will end it. It's an arrogant thing to think that we're going to end this thing. And that we have the power to end what God said. He not only says he's going to end it, he gives us incredible detail on how he's going to end it. For us to think that we're going to end it is, is ridiculous. Now look. Do I think we should throw trash everywhere? No. That's annoying. I mean, I mean, do I think we should, you know what, but you know what that means? If we throw trash everywhere, we're not going to end the earth. It means we're going to be living in a, in a junk pile of trash, California. I've never seen so much trash in my life. We're joking out soul winning. All you have to do is drive long enough in California and you will find a free couch and probably a boat. Because people just throw trash everywhere here. But guess what? It's disgusting. It's ugly. It's annoying. I used to hate when, when hunting season would come along and all the people from the city would come out to the country and they would just throw their cans out the window. And then we would cut hay in the ditches and I'd get, I'd get a bunch of hay bales with beer cans in them. That was really irritating to me. But it wasn't going to destroy the earth. Do I think we should fill the air with smoke? No. But this is where technology and science comes in. And you, you know what would happen if we fill the air with smoke? We're not going to end the earth. We're just going to like, we're going to be unhealthy living in the city is what's going to happen. That's what did happen, and then we fixed it. See? Through what? Through science. Through science. So, but guess what? Guess what? It's arrogant to think that we're going to end it. God literally explains to us how he created it how he is going to end it. The Bible explains everything, but guess what? That is also not science. That's not science. That's just an explanation that God gives us on how it happened. But he does, the difference between the Bible and scientism is God gives us evidence. He gives us evidence. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Turn to Romans chapter 1. God gives us evidence. He doesn't just say, hey, uh, infinity. Hey, billions of years. He's like, no, no, no. No, you will know. I will give you evidence. I will give you a heart. I will give you a heart that knows the law of God. And then in verse number 20 of Romans chapter 1, he says this. He says, this is, everybody starts with two things in their life. Remember this. Everybody starts with a conscience, which is the law God wrote in their heart. And everybody has the creation around them as a witness of what God did. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. He says the invisible things of him. You're like, how could I know that there's a God? How could I know that there's a God when no one's ever told me about it and I just don't know? He said the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made... Even his what? Look at this. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Meaning, everybody's looking around at everything that God built. Everybody's looking around at the creation, at nature, at the trees, at the birds, all these different things. As a matter of fact, look, science cannot prove these things, but we can look around and we can see a witness of God. We can see his creation. We can see that you know, we can see that an invisible God exists because of what he built, is what the Bible is saying. And not only that, we actually copy what he built. Did you know that? We actually know what he built so well that we actually copy it. You look at an um, uh, uh, industry that's huge in California is water treatment. There's so much water treatment. Water's a really big deal in California. You look at water treatment plants. You know what? You know what the mountains are? They are God's water filters. Like, why are there mountains? Why did God create mountains? Everyone's like, well, there were, that mountain was created after billions and billions and billions of years. No, God put that mountain there to be a water filter. 
Because the water evaporates from the ocean and it rains or snows in the mountains. It's a nice little storage system for us as well. And then it flows down the mountains through this huge gravel filter of these, these shallow mountain streams. You know what they use in industrial water treatment plants? Gravel filters. Then, the, you ever seen a mountain stream up top? Up top, I'm talking seven, 8,000 feet. They're very shallow. They're very clear and you can see all the way to the rocks. Many times they're that deep. Why? You know other kind of filters they use in industrial water plants? UV filters. Because UV light, the sunlight, actually cleans the water. It kills bacteria and it cleans the water. So by the time the water gets to the bottom of the mountain, it's clean for you. Again, same water that we drank before. It just again and again and again. Birds. Birds. We never would have been able to have an airplane that flies if we didn't copy the profile of a bird's wing. Ah, so, something exploded and created the bird. Good thing the wing was shaped like that. Where it could have that, you know, that contour of the airfoil of the wing, where, the, where it creates a low pressure above the wing and high pressure. And guess what? What do you get? You get lift. We, we copy God's design all the time. This is why the best scientists, they're actually called engineers today. Science, science is out, that word is out the window. That's why the best scientists are the best engineers throughout the history of mankind have been people that feared God. Because they looked at God's creation and they're just trying to unlock God's answers. Right? But look, science cannot prove everything in the Bible. You say, why? It's a false premise that science can explain everything. This idea of observation, experimentation. Look, some things I just explained to you. Some things God allows us to use science to figure out from what he's given us, from the creation, and, and model those things and rebuild those things. But science cannot explain the creation itself. I can't go and test, I can't go, after my dog dies, I can't say, dog be alive because it won't work, because my word is not quick and it's not powerful. Science cannot explain the miracles in the Bible. Science cannot explain the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the biggest event that has happened in the history of mankind. Science cannot explain. Why? Turn to Matthew chapter 19. I'll tell you why science can't explain this. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. So science can't explain everything in the Bible. All right, but God gives us plenty of evidence to believe the things in the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse number 26. Jesus tells us here why science can't be used to explain everything in the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse number 26. Matthew chapter 19. We're talking about why can't I use science to prove everything in the Bible. So science can't explain everything. That false teaching in the world is called scientism, and it's false, as I've showed you. But science also can explain the major things in the Bible, namely the things that God has done. Why? Look at Matthew chapter 19, look at verse number 26. Jesus says, he says, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. This is why we can't use science to prove everything in the Bible. Because... With us, we can't do everything. But with God, he can do everything. In Revelation 19, there's a word used to describe God called omnipotent, meaning he has all power. You do not have all power. So you cannot recreate what God has done. So look, it takes faith. It takes faith, but it doesn't take blind faith. It doesn't take blind faith. The idea that science explains everything is someone, you know, if they believe that, they don't know what science is. Okay, they're believing something called scientism. And then they just swallow a whole load of literally unimaginable theories. All right, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And then they say, they, they, they swallow these theories that they literally redefine as science. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's, it's moronic, really, when you think about it. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, look at verse number 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse number 12. The Bible says, 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse number 12, it says, I, the preacher, was king over Jeru Israel and Jerusalem. This is, of course, Solomon uh, talking in Ecclesiastes. Solomon was the wisest man that had lived at this point. He was the wisest man on the earth. God just poured wisdom upon him, and he was just, he wrote the Proverbs, he's writing Ecclesiastes, and you look, look what he says, and he says, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. People would come, this is how he got so rich. This is how he got so much gold, because people would come just to hear him talk about the animals and about the creation and all the wisdom that he had, and people would just give him the gold, and this was the Queen of Sheba. They just paid him all this money just for what? For his wisdom, all right? So he said, I searched out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man, that's us, to be exercised therewith. You know what he's saying here? You know what he's saying? This is a really cool statement, but you know what he's talking about? He's talking about science. He's talking about exercising you know, the ability to figure out the natural world, as, the, as the, the definition would call it, or God's creation, as I would call it. What he's saying is the mysteries of God's world are for us to explore. That's what he's saying, through exercising this knowledge. And look at what he says. He says it's hard. He's like, it's hard to figure this stuff out. Why? Because God's so much smarter than us. That's why God is so much higher and above us. But it's with sore travail that men go and they test and they, you know, but the Bible gives us clues though. And that's what we're going to be looking at, you know, in the coming weeks um, on science in the Bible. The Bible gives us clues. And look, if we give God glory and we follow his clues and we experiment and we toil, we will discover. That's, that's how it has happened in the history of of mankind up to this point. But it's also why science has chased its tail for over a hundred years. Science and Einstein and Einstein's, you know, bastard children have chased their tail and created nothing for a hundred years because science decided to go godless. And they decided to just chase all these theories. And that's why they've created nothing. That's why Stephen Hawking and all his theoretical uh, physicists and astronomers and all these people that are just talking about all these different theories of dark matter and all this ridiculousness chasing the Big Bang Theory, they've created and invented nothing. I, I've told you guys before, talking late, it's like, you know, the guy had 160-something IQ. Could we make him make a better lawnmower or something? At least we could get something out of it for the betterment of mankind, you know, for the betterment of this earth. But look, it just wasted everything. I mean, you look at scientists before then. You, you want to, like, read about some real scientists? Go read about the guys that were, like, before 1900. That's where all the magic happened, right back there. You look, you look at the guys that were studying and inventing, not inventing, they were, they were they're not inventing anything, they're, they're discovering. They're discovering, like, magnetic induction. Look, it was always there. It was always there. They just discovered something. They started doing what? They started testing. They started building some apparatuses. They started, you know, getting some hypotheses. I think this is where it's coming from. I think if I do this with it, and then they test that hypothesis, pretty soon we have motors. Pretty soon we have generators. Pretty soon you have electricity in your home. Pretty soon we have lights, and we're not burning candles. But these men, these men feared God. Look, I'm not saying that they were all saved. I'm not saying that they were all saved. Don't get me wrong. But they acknowledged and they feared the Lord, the vast majority of them, before 1900. All right, look, this is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27, I did a whole sermon series on this. It says that God confounds the wise. All these people that claim wisdom today, but they throw God out the window. God just confounds them. They just they they spin their they spin their wheels for their entire life. Einstein invented nothing. He had nothing to do with the atomic bomb. He invented nothing. There's no machine out there that Einstein invented. He has nothing to do with GPS satellites. You just need to read a little bit more because like, people just spew this stuff. 
And none of it's true. None of it's true. God confounds the wise. The people that laugh in his face and, you know, blaspheme him, he's like, I'll just confound you your whole life. You just waste your whole life. And that's what you see happening today with all the wisdom that is out there today, all the scientists today. If you want to find a scientist today, a real scientist, what a scientist used to be back in the 1800s and before, you need to go find an engineer. Because those are the guys that are actually building, testing, experimenting, things like that. The scientist of today, he's, he's gazing around like, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. All this theoretical garbage based on a lie in the first place. All right, so look, the Bible explains everything, okay? Let's get back to the point. The Bible does explain everything, all right? This idea that science explains, that science can explain everything is false. That's called scientism. It's not true. The Bible does explain everything, but science cannot. Okay, science cannot explain everything. The Bible contains some scientific things, and it, they're more like clues for us, right? But science is not theories, and this is the main myth today. There's all these theories, ridiculous ones, that are just passed off as science. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like, create, it's like labeling apples oranges. It's just a complete misdefinition of the word. Science is a tool. Science is a tool that's used to find truth, right? And we can use science to, we can use the Bible, we can use the clues in the Bible, the scientific things in the Bible. Look, the Bible has been ahead on so many scientific things. It, it's, it's ridiculous. But we can use these scientific, this tool of science to prove and test theories. But these educated people today, educated people take these theories, they mischaracterize them, and then, you know, they just make up this idea of scientism, all right? So look, science also, as a tool, it should be pure, right? And I want to mention one last thing before we end tonight. Science should be a pure process. It should be a pure tool. But science today, science, even people that have the process correct, and I've also witnessed this several times in my life, science has been corrupted today. Even people that are, are the ones out there experimenting and testing the process has been horribly corrupted today. You say, how? Why? Well, the why is almost always, every single time that I've witnessed, has been for money. Because you have to understand that certain hypotheses, certain conclusions, pay more. <laughs> and that's, that's really just the way it is. All right, you think about certain, um, I won't name names, but certain drug companies. Certain drug companies, look, this stuff's coming out now. This stuff's coming out now. They didn't report things. They fudged numbers. They didn't do the, the amount of tests that they were supposed to. Why? For money, that's why. To make sales, that's why. Universities. University professors, at least when I was in university, they are paid by, or they are expected to bring in a certain amount of money of, with, from grants for research projects. And look, certain research projects that are trying to test certain, you know, conclusions, test a certain conclusion, they just, they bring in more money. It's very simple, all right? Money makes the world go around, so it's corrupted science today. Unfortunately, actual, the tool of science is very, very corrupt today. I've seen machines built. I've seen machines built that were supposed to be 40% efficient, and then hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on that machine. And it turned out it was 10% efficient. And it's like, no, we're just not going to change that number. We're just not going to change that number. Why? Because we spent that kind of money on it. That's why. That's, there's, there's major corruption here. All right? There's major corruption in science today, even people that have the definition correctly. But the point is, the Bible has all the answers. Okay, So what is the Bible and what is not the Bible? The Bible has all the answers. It has all the explanations for everything, but not all of those explanations can be tested through science because we are not God. We are not omnipotent. It can't be proven through experience, but that's why it takes faith. And look, God wants it to take faith. Okay, it doesn't take blind faith, though. Believing in infinity pressure, that takes blind faith. Believing in billions of years, that takes blind faith. No one's ever seen that kind of pressure. No one has any idea why billions of years? Other than if we just say that number, people will believe that, you know, a cat can become a, a dinosaur or something, you know? Or a plant, a daisy can become 
a person. So it's just billions of years, infinity, that takes blind faith. So scientism is false teaching. It's passing apples off as oranges. I'll stick with the Bible, quite frankly. It has all the explanations. These explanations do not take blind faith. I can look around and I can see what God has built. In the next few weeks, we're going to look at the many scientific things that are in the Bible and just kind of do an exploration on the science and the Bible and science in scientific things in the Bible. Next week, we're actually going to look at science. We're going to look at a scientific experiment in the Bible. And then we will look at scientific things in the Bible. All right, so it's going to be really fun. I like science and I like the Bible. They both go hand in hand and they both complement each other perfectly. All right, it's just these people that say science or the Bible, they don't even understand what they're talking about when they use the word science. All right, they're talking about scientism, which is this false teaching that all these theories are science and that they can't explain everything, which is just completely false. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.